Hello friends, I welcome you to today's lecture on Nature, Scope and Development of Administrative Law. In order to understand the meaning and process of delegation of the legislation, the objectives of the present lecture are as to understand the growth of administrative laws, to analyze various concepts of administrative law, to find out how rule of law is the edifice of administrative law, and to understand the role of judiciary in invalidating those laws which are contrary to rule of law. Nature, Scope and Development of Administrative Law Administrative law evolved as a byproduct of the public law because of the growing socio-economic functions and increasing power of the government. The developments of the past few decades have resulted mainly in the establishment of a system of administrative agencies, tribunals, and law. Even in the 19th century, administrative law was developing in many countries like United States and United Kingdom. And today it is in many phases of equal or greater importance than the judicial system developed through the common law. In essence, administrative law is the law concerning the exercise of authority by administrative agencies and their relationship to the legislature, courts, and the public. Understanding of administrative law requires an appreciation of the need for administrative agencies to assume a legislative role when implementing broad policy directives from the legislature, an understanding of the constitutional, statutory, and judicial constraints on this role. Reasons for growth of administrative law Administrative law seems to have developed from a combination of forces. As observed by Aristotle, the first of all causes and principal one is necessity. Demands for spatial regulation were made when striking abuses appeared with the Industrial Revolution. A practical need for control developed. The legal system which could assert this control had not kept pace with the rapidly changing structure of society and was not readily adapted to the complex situation which was presented to it for adjustment. The development of administrative law is an inevitable necessity of the modern times. A study of administrative law acquaints us with those rules according to which the administration is to be carried on. Administrative law has been characterized as the most outstanding legal development of the 20th century. The rapid growth of administrative law in modern times is the direct result of the growth of administrative powers. The ruling gospel of the 19th century was laissez-faire which manifested itself in the theories of individualism, individual enterprise, and self-help. The philosophy envisages minimum government control, maximum free enterprise, and contractual freedom. It was era of free enterprise. But lesser fair doctrine resulted in human misery. It came to be realized that the bargaining position of every person was not equal, and uncontrolled contractual freedom led to the exploitation of weaker sections by the stronger, for example, of the labor by the management in industries. On the one hand, slums, unhealthy and dangerous conditions of work, child labor, widespread poverty, and exploitation of masses, but on the other hand, concentration of wealth in a few hands became the order of the day. The state started to act in the interests of social justice, and it assumed a positive role. In the course of time, out of dogma of collectivism, emerged the concept of social welfare state, which lays emphasis on the role of state as a vehicle of socio-economic regeneration and welfare of people. Definition of Administrative Law Austin has defined administrative law as, Administrative law is the law which determines the ends and moods to which the sovereign power shall be exercised. In his view, the sovereign power shall be exercised either directly by the monarch or directly by the subordinate political superiors to whom portions of those are delegated or committed in trust. Jennings has defined administrative law as, Administrative law is the law relating to the administration. It determines the organization, powers, and duties of administrative authorities. Dicey in 19th century defines it as, Firstly, portion of a nation's legal system which determines the legal statutes and liabilities of all state officials. Secondly, 
finds the right and liabilities of private individuals in their dealings with public officials. Thirdly, specifies the procedure by which those rights and liabilities are enforced. Casey Davis has defined administrative law as Administrative law is the law concerning the powers and procedures of administrative agencies, including especially the law governing judicial review of administrative action. In the view of Friedman, administrative law includes the legislative powers of the administration, both at common law and under a vast mass of statutes. The administrative powers of the administration, the judicial and quasi-judicial powers of the administration, all of them statutory, the legal liability of public authorities, the powers of the ordinary courts to supervise the administrative authorities. The Indian Institution of Law has defined administrative law in the following words. Administrative law deals with the structure, powers, and functions of organs of administration, the method and procedures followed by them in exercising their powers and functions the method by which they are controlled, and the remedies which are available to a person against them when his rights are infringed by their operation. Rule of law. The term rule of law is derived from French phrase law principi de legalite, which means the principle of legality. It refers to a government based on principle of law and not of man. Edward Koch is said to be the originator of this concept. Dicey's concept of rule of law contains three principles. Number one, absence of discretionary power in the hands of government officials. Number second, person should not be punished except for the breach of law. And number third, the rights must flow from the custom and traditions of people. The modern concept of rule of law is fairly wide. This concept was developed by International Commission of Jurists. This concept implies that the function of government in the society should be so exercised as to create conditions in which dignity of man as an individual is upheld. The courts in India have established rule of law. The public administration has effectively implemented rule of law. Today, the administrative process has grown so much that we are not governed but administered. In the case of ADM Jabalpur versus Shivkant Shukla, an attempt was made to challenge the administrative order during emergency on the ground that it violates the principle of rule of law. Though the contention did not succeed, but this case made it clear that the rule of law can be used as a legal concept. In Keshwananda Bharati versus State of Kerala, the rule of law was considered as the basic structure of Indian constitution. In Indra Nehru Gandhi versus Raj Narayan, judges held that Article 329A offends the concept of rule of law. The court in the case of Som Raj versus State of Haryana observed that the absence of arbitrary power is the first postulate of rule of law. Thus, the secondary meaning of rule of law is that the government should be conducted within a framework of recognized rules and principles which restrict discretionary powers. Another conceptual understanding of rule of law is the independence of the judiciary and the supremacy of courts. Although complete absence of discretionary powers or absence of inequality are not possible in the administrative age, yet the concept of rule of law has been developed and is prevalent in common law countries such as India. The rule of law has provided a sort of touchstone to judge and test the administrative law prevailing in the country at a given time. Rule of law traditionally denotes the absence of arbitrary powers, and hence one can denounce the increase of arbitrary or discretionary powers of the administration and advocate controlling it through procedures and other means. Rule of law for that matter is also associated with supremacy of courts. Therefore, in the ultimate analysis, courts should have the power to control the administrative action and any overt diminution of that power is to be criticized. The principle implicit in the rule of law that the executive must act under the law and not by its own fate is still a cardinal principle of the common law system, which is being followed by India. Dicey's theory of rule of law has been adopted and incorporated in the Indian constitution.
the three arms legislature, executive and judiciary work in accordance with each other. Rule of law also implies a certain procedure of law to be followed. Anything out of the purview of the relevant law can be termed as ultra virus. In Secretary State of Karnataka and others versus Uma Devi, a constitutional bench of this court has laid down the law in the following terms. Thus, it is clear that adherence to the rule of equality in public employment is a basic feature of our constitution. And since the rule of law is the core of our constitution, a court would certainly be not disabled from passing an order upholding a violation of Article 14 or in ordering the overlooking of the need to comply with the requirements of Article 14 read with Article 16 of the constitution. In another case, Chief Settlement Commissioner Punjab v. Om Prakash, it was observed by the Supreme Court that in our constitutional system, the central and most characteristic feature is the concept of rule of law, which means in the present context, the authority of law courts to test all administrative action by the standard of legality. The administrative or executive action that does not meet the standard will be set aside if the aggrieved person brings the matter into notice. It is indeed unthinkable that in a democracy governed by the rule of law, the executive government or any office officers should possess arbitrary power over the interests of the individual. Every action of the executive government must be informed with reason and should be free from arbitrariness. That is the very essence of the rule of law and its bare minimum requirement. Yet another case is of Yusuf Khan versus Manohar Joshi, in which the Supreme Court laid down the proposition that it is the duty of the state to preserve and protect the law and the constitution, and that it cannot permit any violent act which may negate the rule of law. Hence, it is quite evident that the concept of rule of law is gaining importance and attention and judicial efforts are made to make it more strong. Separation of powers. The doctrine of separation of powers deals with the mutual relations among the three organs of the government, namely legislature, executive, and judiciary. Montesquieu said that if the executive and the legislature are the same person or body of person, there would be a danger of the legislature enacting oppressive laws which the executive will administer to attain its own ends. For laws to be enforced by the same body that enacts them result in arbitrary rule and makes the judge a legislator rather than an interpreter of law. If one person or body of persons could exercise both the executive and judicial powers in the same matter, there would be arbitrary powers, which would amount to complete tyranny if the legislative powers would be added to the power of that person. The value of the doctrine lies in the fact that it seeks to preserve human liberty by avoiding the concentration of powers in one person or body of persons. The different organs of government should thus be prevented from encroaching on the province of the other organ. In United Kingdom, the famous English jurist Blackstone supported the doctrine of Montesquieu. According to him, Wherever the right of making and enforcing the law is vested in the same man or in the same body of man, there can be no liberty. During the 17th century in England, Parliament exercised legislative powers. The king exercised executive powers and the courts exercised judicial powers. But with the emergence of cabinet system of government, that is parliamentary form of government, the doctrine remains no good. The renowned constitutional Bajot observed, the cabinet is a hyphen which joins, buckle which fastens the legislative part of the state to the executive part of the state. According to Wade and Flips, the doctrine of separation of powers implies, the same person should not form more than one organ of the government. One organ of the government should not exercise the functions of other organs of the government. One organ of the government should not encroach with the function of the other two organs of the government. Now the question in subject is whether this doctrine finds a place in England. In England, the king being the executive head is also an integral part of the legislature. 
his ministers are also members of one or other houses of parliament. This concept goes against the idea that same person should not form part of more than one organ of the government. Donamore committee has aptly remarked, in the British constitution, there is no such thing as the absolute separation of legislative, executive, and judicial powers. Federal Constitution of the United States of America does not expressly provide for the principle of separation of powers. Having reliance on the doctrine of Montesquieu, Madison the Federalist observed, the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, in the same hands, whether of one, a few, or many, and whether hereditary, self-appointed, or elective, may justly be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. Now we have to see what is the real position in India regarding the separation of powers. President being the executive head is also empowered to exercise legislative powers. In his legislative capacity, he may promulgate ordinances in order to meet the situation. As Article 123 Clause 1 says, if at any time, except when both houses of parliament are in session, president is satisfied that circumstances exist, which render it necessary for him to take immediate action, he may promulgate such ordinance as the circumstances appear to him to require. When proclamation of emergency has been declared by the president due to failure of constitutional machinery, the president has been given legislative power under Article 357 of our constitution to make any law in order to meet the situation. A power has also been conferred on the President of India under Article 372 and 372A to adapt any law in the country by making such adaptations and modifications, whether by way of repeal or amendment, as may be necessary or expedient for the purpose, or bring the provisions of such law into accord with the provisions of the Constitution. The President of India also exercises judicial function. Article 103, Clause 1 of the Constitution is notable in this connection. According to this article, if any question arises as to whether a member or either House of Parliament has become subject to disqualification mentioned in Clause 1 of Article 102, the question shall be referred for decision of the President, and his decision shall be final. Article 50 lays emphasis to separate judiciary from executive. But in practice, we find that the executive also exercises the power of judiciary as in the appointment of judges. The legislature, that is either House of Parliament, also exercises judicial function in removal of president in the prescribed manner. Judiciary also exercises legislative power. High courts and Supreme Court are empowered to make certain rules legislative in character. Whenever High Courts or Supreme Court finds certain provision of law against the Constitution or public policy, it declares the same null and void, and then amendments may be incorporated in the legal system. Sometimes High Courts and Supreme Court formulate the principles on the point while law is silent. This power is also legislative in character. Therefore, the doctrine of separation of powers has no place in strict sense in Indian Constitution. But the functions of different organs of the government have been sufficiently differentiated so that one organ of the government could not usurp the functions of another. Separation of powers and judicial opinion. The following cases explain the real position of doctrine of separation of powers prevailing in our country. In Reed Delhi Law Act case, Honorable Chief Justice Kanaya observed, Although in the Constitution of India there is no express separation of powers, it is clear that a legislature is created by the Constitution and detailed provisions are made for making that legislature pass laws. It is then too much to say that under the Constitution, the duty to make laws, the duty to exercise its own wisdom, judgment and patriotism in making law is primarily cost on the legislature. Does it not imply that unless it can be gathered from other provisions of the constitution, other bodies, executive or judicial, are not intended to discharge legislative functions? To the same effect, another case is Rai Sahab Ram Jawaya versus the state of Punjab, in which the Honorable Chief Justice B.K. Mukherjee observed, 
the Indian constitution has not indeed recognized the doctrine of separation of powers in the absolute rigidity, but the functions of different parts or branches of the government have been sufficiently differentiated. And consequently, it can very well be said that our constitution does not contemplate assumption by one organ or part of the state of the functions that essentially belong to another. In Ram Krishna Dalmia versus Justice Tandolkar, Honorable Chief Justice S. R. Das opined that in the absence of specific provision for the separation of powers in our constitution, such as there is under the American constitution, same such division of powers, legislative, executive, and judicial, is nevertheless implicit in our constitution. In Hari Shankar Nagla versus State of MP, it was observed. The legislature cannot delegate its functions of laying down legislative policy in respect of a major and its formulation as a rule of conduct. The legislature must declare the policy of the law and the legal principles which are to control any given cases and must provide a standard to guide the officials or the body in power to execute the law. The essential legislature function consists in the determination of the choice of legislative policy and of formally enacting that policy into a binding rule of conduct. Virtually, absolute separation of powers is not possible in any form of government. In view of the variety of situations, the legislature cannot foresee or anticipate all the circumstances to which a legislative measure should be extended and applied. Therefore, legislature is empowered to delegate some of its functions to administrative authority. In Asif Hamid versus State of Jammu and Kashmir, Supreme Court observed, I quote, Although the doctrine of separation of powers has not been recognized under the Constitution in its absolute rigidity, but the Constitution makers have meticulously defined the functions of various organs of the state, legislature, executive, and judiciary have to function within their own spheres, demarcated under the Constitution. No organ can usurp the functions assigned to another. The constitution trusts to the judgment of these organs to function and exercise their discretion by strictly following the procedure prescribed therein. The functioning of democracy depends upon the strength and independence of each of its organs. While concluding, it may be pointed out that the functions of a modern state, unlike the police states of old, are not confined to mere collection of taxes or maintenance of laws and protection of the realm from external or internal enemies. A modern state is certainly expected to engage in all activities necessary for the promotion of the social and economic welfare of the community. With the widening of the horizons of judicial activism, criticism emanated from a few percent of the people that the judiciary is overstepping its bounds and taking over government functions. But this is not a justifiable thought. But the truth is that Supreme Court and High Courts act as watchdogs to keep executive and legislature within the bounds of law. With these words, I conclude today's lecture. Hope you have understood fully. Thank you.